everyone. Welcome uh, to another One Book, One College event. We continue our conversations around Eve Ewan's 1919, and I am so excited and honored to be here today with Dr. Janice Tuck Lively, who is a dear friend, a mentor, and practically family to me. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Lively, and uh, then we'll get into our conversation. Dr. Janice Duck Lively is a published writer of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Her work celebrates and examines the joys and struggles of Black women's lives and has appeared in many literary journals, academic journals, and anthologies. Tuck Lively is a 2019 Illinois Arts Council Literary Award winner and a 2016 Pushkar Award nominee. She's received a Summary Literary Seminars 2014 Editor's Choice Award and was a semi-finalist in 2015 for the Dana Award, The Novel. Her, her collaborative play, Indignant Women, Conversations with Lorraine Hasbury and Gwendolyn Brooks was performed at the Chicago Humanities Festival in 2019. Tuck Lively has also been awarded residencies at Ragdale Artist Colony, Kalalu Writers Workshop at Brown University, and the Turkey Land Cove Artist Colony at Martha's Vineyard. Janice Tuck Lively is a professor in the Department of English at Elmhurst University, where she teaches fiction writing, creative nonfiction, and multicultural post-colonial literature. As you see, ladies and gentlemen, today we will be having conversations with a brilliant woman and a brilliant writer, and I'm excited. So let's get started. So how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Uh, in the midst of this pandemic, I'm trying to remain like everyone else, healthy and sane and maintain some sense of uh, normalcy. So today is a wonderful opportunity to do that by engaging in um, creative intellectualism, I call it, yeah. I am so excited you agreed to do this for us today. Moraine is privileged to have you in this little time we have together to discuss uh, this wonderful work by Eve Ewan. It is great. So yeah. let me start off by asking you, um, when I called you up and asked you to do this and, and you agreed, <laughs> after you got the book and read the book, yeah. What was your reaction? How, how did you, after in reading this work, what? How yeah. were you feeling? What was your response? Um, to be absolutely honest, and I don't know any other way to be, I was a little upset that I had said yes, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. The work itself is beautiful and it is moving, um, but it touched on so it pushed so many buttons uh, regarding the political situation that is going on right now in our culture as it relates to um, people of color and the Black Lives Matter um, movement. And so when I read this, it stirred up um, a bit of anger and sadness and all of those other emotions because it caused me to consider how much has changed since 1919 and now 2020. Um, that's what I think makes this work so important, what e-viewing has done here. So I was thinking, why in the world did I say yes? <laughs> but it gave me an opportunity to be introduced to a, a wonderful work, which I planned to read. Um, but it also forced me to think about some things historically, which is good. They don't need to be ignored. Yeah. So I thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for nevertheless agreeing. Now, as an expert in poetry and teaching poetry and writing, why do you think Eve Ewan chose to uh, use poetry in this manner? Now, she references the historical documents she came yes. across. Yeah. Um, and it just want, I just wonder why, what, what do you think is captured? Why do you think someone like her would choose to use poetry to talk about 1919? What does it do for the audience and the reader? I think one of the things is that um, Eve Ewing is a poet. She does, she does poetry. And um, I recently saw her in an interview at the, um, she was a, a panelist at the Chicago State Black Writers Conference. 
And I was listening to her speak then. And at that time she read her, uh, the poem from this collection regarding Emmett Till. And one of the things that poetry does, it allowed her to give us postcard size glimpses of the moment. And it also allowed her to reflect a myriad of voices. Usually with, you know, with fiction, we're focusing on one character. Even if it's an epic, we're following this one character's story. With her using poetry, in my opinion, it has allowed for the introduction of several voices and for us to look at this from various perspectives. And I think that's another reason why it works so well uh, because it did not involve just um, one person. This was about a people in Chicago in 1919, yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons why poetry works so well in this, uh, for this particular subject matter. Okay. Do you would would this con would this uh this this uh anthology this book of poetry? Do you did it evoke as you think about the history and and, and I know you're very well versed and you know growing up in Chicago you have your stories that we will discuss later. Um, what do you think? Did it evoke? Was it? Um, do you think it at captured history do you think yeah. uh, having this poetry that connects to history was really powerful what do you what do you mm -hmm. think about it like what um, do you think it can do for us one of the things that I think that poetry does again it's very descriptive and as I was reading and being raised in Chicago I imagine these places many of the places that she discusses the streets, the place that I, I began to conjure them up in my mind. And um, what I think the, the idea of the, um, the poetry and what it evokes, again, we hear individual voices. One, one of the things that she says um, on the, I think page three of the book, it says, this book is a story. And one of the reasons why she said she wrote it, it was to figure out what was the reality of everyday life for people in their, for black people in their era. And so that's what they set out to do. The individuals that created the um, study of race relations and the race riot. And I think that's what through poetry, uh, Eve Ewing is doing. We're getting the everyday lives of individual um, black people from the time they made their trek north up until the point of the riots and after. Uh, so that, that, and poetry is an excellent vehicle because it can be very epic, but then it can give you just small, tight images and just a single word that carries so much importance. So yeah, I, I, I would not have, I wish I had thought of it as a matter of fact. And as I was reading, I'm like, what subject, what story can I tell through poetry? Yeah, because it, it's more so um, an epic poem if you will, even though she's cut it down uh, into the individual poems and give us individual scenes, there is still a sense of it being an epic um, inherent in it because of that, with the poetry. Wow. Yes, I, I, I recall reading it and, and thinking about how powerful it was and descriptive to be able yes. to envision everything that was happening at this time. And it really also informed me about that time, because yes. if we talk a little bit about history, you know, the great migration took mm -hmm. place and you hear about this great migration, me moving to Chicago, learning that a lot of people from Mississippi and the South moved here. Yes. Um, and is it, it is in that context that she talks, that she speaks in this book about these riots. Um, T the, tell me, the Great Migration, wh what comes to mind when you think about that and when you think about, I know your family came up. Yeah. Um, you have that history there, there as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, my, my family, and I'm looking for this right now, um, my family came up uh, in the, what would have been considered, I guess, that second wave, because there were two waves, one right after World War I, and there was another one after World War II. So we are part of that second wave. But when I think about that first great migration, 
um, two books come to mind. And I was checking with that. One book is the one by um, uh, Farrah Griffin, and it's called Who Set You Flowing? The African-American uh, Migration Narrative. And it's a matter of what set this wave of Black bodies into uh, a motion. When I, I think about that, it's who set you flowing? What let this tidal wave of Black people loose? And we began flowing from upward, which would be the opposite direction. We were flowing from south to north. And then the other book, 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 I'm trying to remember the author, The Warmth of Another Sun. And uh, that again, you're familiar with that because I can't remember the author. Um, she's, um, she's written cast. I, I will yeah. get her name for you, but uh, she, I, I, I know her, yes. Yeah. And both of those narratives speak about the great migration. And I think The Warmth of Another Sun does it in a way, and it seems like personal stories similar to what um, we have with uh, what Eve Ewing is doing. But when I think about it, it makes me imagine uh, with Chicago, all those black folks coming from the South. It was, I think uh, a few years ago when I was in grad school that I realized the pattern, like how did we get to Chicago? I asked my mother once, why did we get to, how did we get to Chicago? Why didn't you go to California? And my mother said, why well, I started to go to California, she said, but she came here, her and my aunt, and they, um, she said they, get, they got in the job, they're gonna work a few weeks, then go out to California, and she just never left. So you look at, I realized that the, the, the people were following, I guess, the interstate routes, because when you look at Chicago, we have people from what, Mississippi, Alabama, um, Arkansas, we get Arkansas and some Tennessee, but then you think about New York and, Pens and Pennsylvania, they get the Carolinas, they get the people from Florida. So just following those routes. Um, and uh, many of them that my grandmother used to tell a story, if I can digress a minute. Uh, we laugh, I asked my mom how we got here. And she said, my mother walked to Chicago when she had rags tied to her feet. And then she was sitting in the park with no shoes. She met my, uh, my stepfather and he said, Oh, if you marry me, I'll buy you some shoes. And so uh, she said she did. And it would make my mother very angry. But what my grandmother didn't realize, or what I didn't realize my grandmother was doing, was telling me the story of the people of great migration because many of them did walk. Many of them did walk to Chicago because there was such a wave of black people moving at that time that in some situations, the um, because they were leaving those sharecropper jobs that what I call legalized slavery that existed up until the 1970s. Um, and so in many cases, the bus stations and train stations were barred so that black people could not leave. They were not being allowed to leave in some of those towns. And it was almost the new underground railroad taking place. So when I think about the great migration it was almost like a still of following that northern star, trying to make your way north and to freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the author's name, by the way, is Isabel Wilkerson. Yes. 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 Yeah. And I have her book cast I'm about to start reading. But as you talk about that, I, I got a taste of that recently. And um, I know you haven't seen it yet on the, the series Lovecraft Country. Um, which is focused in, in the 1960s and it goes back and forth throughout time. But uh, in, in the one instance, the two uh, black people are actually sitting in the back of the bus, the bus breaks down. This is at the very, very beginning. Good. Okay. And uh, another bus, another vehicle comes to take, take those who, who, who were stranded because the bus broke down, but it didn't take the black people. So they ended up walking into the town that was coming and I thought about it I think about how even now we see you know I can't help but draw the parallels we see immigrants try and walk in from Colombia and places yeah. in South America up up through um, Mexico to try to come into the states because they're refugees and they you know they're they're, they're hoping for a better life and they're trying to escape what is the horrid and horrible instances that they know they'd experience. And, you know, and I can't help but think about that even so 
um, with the South pretty much still after the Civil War really still having slavery more or less, right? With the sharecroppers and so on. And so these people had hope and they were walking for a different life. And that was yeah. their hope, you know? Um, it became, even, um, and one of this, and, and she starts out with that in the very beginning of the book, which I love because throughout slavery, there had been an identification by African-Americans with Moses and the children of Israel and trying to come from under the bondage of Pharaoh and, and slavery and oppression that they were experiencing in Egypt. And um, so that was the identification because even with Harriet Tugman and the work she did with the Underground Railroad, they called her Black Moses. They called her because she was leading the people out of a bondage into freedom. So you have that and that her very first story that she um, begins to talk about in Exodus 1, there is this idea of wanting to be free. When we say, well, they were already free at this point. Well, there was reconstruction, but then came, and that lasted a short, I believe, it might've been eight years. I'm not quite sure, but then you got post reconstruction. And because of some political uh, goings on behind the scene, those black people were sold out. So all the, the things that they had gained during reconstruction, they lost and was almost like being catapulted into slavery again, because with post reconstruction, black, folk, black men, because it was men, women weren't ready for both them, black men were voting. That was why uh, during reconstruction, we did have black senators and congressmen. And that was why they kept saying Barack Obama, former President Barack Obama was the first uh, black senator since reconstruction. Because during reconstruction, there were rights and liberties we had and we lost them all in post reconstruction. That's when you got all the lynchings and it was referred to as the black nadir, the darkest period of time in the history of black people since slavery. And it was at this moment that they were saying enough. They were having to leave um, uh, the period, the place of their birth um, in search of something new. Uh, in her, in that second poem that she presents us with, the train speaks the very two last lines, the three last lines, it is the train that is speaking. And the train says, my children, my precious ones, I can never take you home. Can't go back to Africa. You, you now have none. There is a disconnect. They are not Africans. They are African-American, American of African descent. And she says, and so you go out into the wind. The, the question of the 20th century, what to do with the Negro. These people that she is presenting in this book, um, that are making this great pilgrimage, uh, migrating from one point to the next, were never designed, was never intended that they should be a part of the fabric of the country other than in servitude. So now what do we do with them? And they're wondering too, what do we do? And so we pick up our, our as you saw the, the Israelites picking up everything they had and trying to make their way out of Egypt. And so that's what she gives us at the very opening of this story. And that was the situation for African-Americans at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, we have to go somewhere, but where do we go? That we can claim the promise of America. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think about this too in the context of um, what America has recently learned about the Tulsa massacre, right? And that was 1920. So right in this period where black people were thriving, black Black Wall Street, and they were doing yes. really well. And then they came in and burned it, right? Yeah. From hate and racism, all of the yes. white people came in and burned it, you know? And so if I think about this in light of every, in the context of this as well, of what was happening throughout yes. America. Yes. You know, and, and, and you know what's so interesting, Shania, that you put that on the table. There was Black Wall Street in Oklahoma, um, my son used, recently shared a podcast with me of what happened in um, 
Wilmington, North Carolina, after slavery, blacks and whites were living in harmony with one another. Um, but it got to the point, a number, a good number of the black people were becoming more successful with the newspapers and with their businesses. And as a result, um, an envy set in, then an anger that was fueled by hatred. And um, where you once had two people living in harmony with one another, um, a plan was devised through what we now call fake news. They began in the white newspapers accusing black men of raping white women. They were uh, putting numbers and said just last week, six white women were raped and, and trying to incite the general public against African-Americans because this was some wealthy people, uh, white men that had businesses and they were being threatened by the black businesses just like with Black Wall Street. And so as a result, um, they lynched the majority of the black men in that city. It's a, it's a hidden um, history that's not talked about a lot with, um, within um, North Carolina's history. And there was some young academics they went and did the uh, um, uh, archaeological work and reclaim and dug into the facts and they have the evidence of it. And as a result of what happened then, there is still this, um, this separation and inequality that exists in that place to this day when that was not how it started out. Um, so you have this situation where you're, you're telling these people, you need to prove yourselves you need to be productive, but there is nothing uh, systemically to help promote that. And then when they do, there are systems in place to try to, um, the dust, it, 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 it uh, hold on one second, just, oh, it presses it down. Um, so it, it's almost like I'm thinking about the people that were in this store, in this poem. What do we do? What do you want? What do you want from us? Um, um, we're trying to be the citizens that you uh, require us to be, that we desire to be, but yet everything in, in, it is in place to keep us from doing that. Um, so like you said, Black Wall Street in Oklahoma, perfect example, but we found it was in Florida, it was in so many other places as well, yeah. I heard even Milwaukee had, um, had that as well. So yes. it sounds like there's a lot of hidden history, not only yes. in North Carolina, yes. but in America as a whole. Yes. And the history that really encapsulates this country and the, the history of African-Americans on this land is not fully told. Yes. No, and there is a huge disconnect that then continues to take place. And so we end up repeating history. Yes. So speaking of repeating history, we're, we had these issues then. Yes. Have we changed much? Uh, and this is where reading this made me say, why did I say yes to this? Because I will be absolutely honest. I see a number of the same things in place uh, in 1919 that it's still in place now. It may not be as overt, but it's still in place. I was making um, a couple of notes for myself and um, I, um, I, I wrote down, why were these people leaving? And they were seeking higher wages, better jobs, escape from the system of um, deer cropping, wanted a better education for their children. Yeah. Um, and we know now what's happening with the coronavirus, it's the cracks in the educational system. They're beginning to show this inequity as it relates to resources. So um, they wanted voting rights. And they also wanted to escape from the physical violence that um, they were facing in terms of lynchings and um, um, lynch mobs. There's not lynch mobs per se now, but there is violence because if there was not, there would not be a need for Black Lives Matter. Am I correct to say our lives matter? 
So when I think about 1919 and I look at 2020, um, what happened with 1919, that riot, it started with um, the death of one young black man. Um, and we were talking about his name was um, Eugene Williams. We didn't, we, so when we think about just um, April, May in Chicago and a whole lot of other places internationally, as a matter of fact, because we saw protests. There was one name associated with all of that, George Floyd. When we think about what happened in Ferguson, there's a name, there's, a, there's this list of names. Um, and so it's the same thing that's happening. The riots are coming out of a sense of anger and frustration with the, uh, with the uh, system. Because those black people had said how they were standing there at the beach, just waiting um, for something to happen, something to be done. One of the um, 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 poems that she gives us, and it's it went in the section of what happened, it's from the perspective of um, the uh, of James Crawford. They were just standing there at the beach waiting for something. There's a young black man that has now been murdered. What are you going to do? They were standing there waiting for justice and none came. I think at the very beginning, because she was giving us an epigraph at the beginning and it's James Crawford speaks. It said the Negro crowd from the beach gathered at the foot of 29th street as it became more and more excited. A group of officers was called by the police who had been at the beach. James Crawford, a Negro, fired into the group of officers and was himself shot and killed by a Negro policeman who had been sent to help restore order. Um, he's saying he saw all the white faces. He's standing there waiting mm -hmm. for justice and there was none. So he fired into that crowd like, I will get my own justice. And as a matter as a fact, you got this the rioting began, and not only in Chicago, that was called that Red Summer. They were cropping up all over the country the same way with the death of George Floyd. If they had arrested the policeman that had his knee on George Floyd's neck to say this was inappropriate, if his fellow officers had put the handcuffs on him and said, you can't do this, you would not, in my opinion, have seen the rage and then the resulting uh, rioting that you did. But there was a sense of there is still no justice in this place. So the conditions I believe that existed in 1919 and the circumstances and that initial uh, flint spark that was hit against it, that uh, caused things to erupt, those type of conditions I believe still erupt now. We saw it with Trayvon Martin's death. We saw it in Ferguson, Missouri. We still see it because the same conditions are in place. Have we made progress? Yes. But do we have more progress to make? Yes, because living, reading through what Eve Crawford has given us in 1919, I'm sorry, Eve, Eve Ewing, I'm, I'm, my James Crawford is on my mind. But given what Eve Ewing gives us, the voices that are speaking, pictures that she's, images she's depicting, we can relate, we can find those same things going on right now in our country and unfortunately within our city. Yeah. 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 I, I think about um, when, uh, when I read it, I felt that I, I felt it was prior to November 20, you know, 2020. And I, I really felt yeah. like, has, has much really changed? You know, I think about King who said riots are language of the unheard, you know, and, and have we, we gone unheard for so long? Will, will justice, will we ever see justice? You think justice. will, will things ever change? Will a system that has set out and designed to oppress people of color, do you think we'll see change? That was, as I was reflecting on today, and our conversation and um, on this powerful work that Eve Ewing has given us. It is very, 
is very quiet, but it's very powerful. And I asked myself that same question. Um, will there ever be justice uh, in this country? And not only for African-Americans, I'm thinking about for people of color in general, those you were talking about, people that were coming up from Central America. I'm thinking about those children um, in Texas that have been separated from their families um, that are in detention centers, concentration camps. I don't care what nice, polite names we have given to them. Um, and it makes me wonder where is our sense of compassion? Because one of the things that, the, as you were speaking about the, the, the immigrants coming up from Mexico and from some of these other places, what made them different from the ones coming from Ellis Island? They want the exact same things. Um, I, and what well, I once taught, because another class that I teach is um, readings and race, class, and gender. And I had a young Caucasian woman in my class, young woman, and she was, she was sweet, but I could see her struggling with the truth of what I was saying because it so contradicted the stereotypes of which she had been raised with as related to people of color. And so um, I asked her the question, I said, um, she said, well, you know, uh, her, her, her parents had worked for their home in their neighborhood. I said, your parents worked very hard because they wanted a good, safe neighborhood for you, right? She said, yes. And I said, and they wanted good schools for you, right? And she said, yes. I said, and they wanted some place clean and a place where they felt that you would be safe to play. Am I correct? She said, yes. I said, and I want the same thing for my children. So it's, so it's getting to the point. And when I said that, all of a sudden, she, it looked different. There wasn't this black faceless mob that she saw. She saw this black face that's Dr. Lively. And it's like, I want what you want. And um, those people that are coming, they want the same things that we've, they've been promised that opportunity here. And that's why they choose to come here. Um, um, but there is a sense when it comes to the justice, uh, I, I, I love your, your line that you have with your e emails and when you talk about equality. What was it again? Can you say it for me, uh, Shane? Because it's your little tagline at the end of your email. Yeah, I added that a few weeks ago. Basically, fairness is not that everybody gets the same, but everybody gets what they need. Yes. By Rick Rodden. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, the, it's the thing of equal opportunity. And that was why in the 1960s, um, James Brown, his song, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Just open up the door and I'll get it myself. All I want, all these people in 1919 wanted was the opportunity to come and make a living for themselves and their families. They were not asking for special treatment. They were not asked to be uh, placed above anyone else. They just wanted a fair chance. And that was what was being denied. Um, I read in one of the poems that uh, uh, this was during the, the riots that the way the, the train system, because when I was a kid coming up, there were bus lines going all over the city, that there was a gap between the bus lines. And so there were black men that worked at the stockyards there, um, um, there in that area of the, with the stockyards, it was like, 435 acres of land. It was big, the, the Chicago stockyards. If you've ever been to the South Side, those men, the buses would only go so far and they were having to get off because of the riding and walk through the very neighborhoods of the people that were um, um, attacking black people. Um, many of them, when they did make it home, they were not able to get back to work because of the rioting was going on. They were afraid to have to go through those neighborhoods. So they didn't get their paycheck. So how are they gonna pay their rent and feed their families? Well, if you can't come and get your check, then I don't know what we're gonna do for you. It's just the idea of fairness. And so when I think about justice, for me, justice is, an, there's an element of fairness. I can count on 
fairness when we talk about justice. And so with that being the case, I've taken a long way around, but my answer to your question is, I don't know. But I do know that collectively, as a human population comprised of various colors and ethnicities and religious uh, orientations and, 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 and gender orientations, we must fight for it. We must continue to move towards uh, whether they'll see it in my lifetime, I have no idea. The way it's going, I'm not, I'm not so sure. But I do know it is something we must continue to strive for. Yeah, that's what I feel. Because when I read 19 and I look at 2020, I'm seeing very little difference as it relates to the condition. Absolutely. The class. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I am... Um... I think about, we, we have to hang on to that hope, right? The, the yes. hope, if we don't have hope, we don't have anything. I know, I know you and I are, um, we, we go to the same church, you know, you're a deacon yes. at our church. And, and I often tell people, um, because my faith is part of what keeps me as I think yes. about these injustices, yeah. right? Thinking about what Jesus himself went through. Um, yes from our faith and that he was an innocent man who died and thinking about the hope that we have. I often tell people that's what keep me when I look around and I see everything that's happening and we rely on a system. I just this uh, morning, I was watching Good Morning America and they have an upcoming uh, special on Brianna Taylor. And I think about that young lady who was in her bed and they bust open and shot her dad. And then the district attorney, one of the jurors was speaking out and she was like the, the district attorney and the attorneys who brought the case before the grand jury, they rushed through it. They did never presented murder. They didn't present all of the evidence. And then the district attorney came out and said, well, the grand jury didn't find for murder. They didn't find, but they were never presented with that. So I think about this justice system that sometimes we have faith in and hope in. And really, can we have faith and hope in a system that was designed, that wasn't designed with us in mind and that continues to oppress? You know, we think about, I think about policing and I share my thoughts where it's the system. It's not a good cop, bad yeah. cop matter. It's yeah. much deeper than that police and one of the reasons it started was to protect property and mm -hmm. as you know to capture slaves back <laughs> so what are we really expecting you know yeah. we need to have these conversations yeah. um because we're ever going to see change and reform we have to be realistic and look at what is really happening i think sometimes as a country we we're so individualistic focus we're so oh he was a bad cop oh others aren't like that you know oh this person or that person we don't take time to look at the overarching system we don't take time to 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 realize we need to deconstruct and decolonize i was telling you um i read a i presented an article last night about decolonization and i think about that it that america was colonized and all of the Caribbean, where I'm from, and the continent of Africa and everywhere else. And with colonization came these fundamental principles yes. that were based on um, European views from European mm -hmm. philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. And from that colonization, you got certain philosophies, the philosophy of um, you have white people European Americans who are superior and they had to find a way to justify slavery. Mm -hmm. So there was a way where eventually you dehumanize a group of people and you objectify a group of people and you use certain phrasing and you eventually get people to buy into it. You get buy into it, you know? And even right now I'm reading a, um, a book called Blaming the Victim by William Ryan. It was written in 1971. And, and he talks a lot about this. He talks, the quote I love, he says, blaming the victim is an ideal, almost painless evasion. So what he shares is that as a society, 
we have chosen and we have bought into blaming the victim for when things happen. Mm -hmm. From a lady being raped yes. to the crime we see on our inner cities or the, the lack of education um, or the subpar education that our kids are getting in on the west side or on the south side of mm -hmm. Chicago. We blame the students, we blame the victims because it eases our conscience. And yes. that's the essence of what he's saying is that we yes. found ways to Ease pass that blame because <laughs> if not, we would have to admit the world isn't just. Yes. We would have to admit the systems in which we operate isn't just and was no. set up to benefit some and disenfranchise that. others. <laughs> And so instead of doing that, we, you know, I think about cognitive dissonance in psychology. Yes. And so we either change our beliefs for cognitive dissonance when your beliefs and your actions don't line up. No, you either don't. change your beliefs <laughs> or you change your actions. And so for so many, it's easier to change your beliefs than to right? change our actions. Yeah. Than to yeah. change our actions. What, one of the, the two things you said that I find so very, very important, uh, this idea of police and policing, um, the, 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 uh, the motto is to serve and protect. That was not the original intent. As you said, it was policing to control bodies, to, to restrict uh, uh, certain activities. And that's what is going on. And this whole idea of hopelessness, um, do I have confidence in the system? And I know my late husband, he, he, we just gotta keep you keep, we keep voting, we keep doing these things. We have to um, uh, in order to bring about change. Whether or not we see it or not, we continue to invest in that system. However, um, I think the majority of the change will come not so much from the system realizing we have to change because we see that with our current, with the aftermath of our current election and uh, the drama continues, but I have faith not so much in the system, I have faith in the people. That is what I have faith in the hearts of people and that is what I think is going to bring about the change. When I see these young people of various ethnicities out there on the front lines fighting the battles, of various genders and fighting the battle, that is what gives me hope. I tell my students all the time, I tell them, I say, I believe in you. I have been, I said, I've lived too long and seen so many things that I have very little faith in the system, but I'm so proud of them because their hope gives me hope. Um, uh, when uh, President Obama was um, uh, running for president the first time around, I was so angry with him. I did not want him to do that. I was so excited that we have a black man as a senator in the US Congress, why you wanna go and mess it up? They're just gonna kill you if you do that. Because I had lived as a little girl during the 60s, I saw King assassinated. I saw Mal Malcolm X assassinated, Medgar Evans assassinated. I saw the Kennedy brothers. I just saw murder after murder of every voice that was trying to make a difference. I'm like, I don't want you to do that for us. I didn't wanna sacrifice him. And so I was thinking, it's like, this is America. They are not gonna elect a black man, but my son's generation, and you are part of that generation, they were excited and they believed, yes, we can. And my students at the Elmhurst University, they were so excited, Dr. Live, and this was black and white students, everyone. And so that morning that we saw that he, that President Obama had been elected, this is his first term, I walked into my American Lit classroom and I said to my students, I said, congratulations, your president, one, your candidate one, and I and they start laughing. I'll stand there with tears in my eyes. I said, You believed what I could not believe because of my engagement with the history of this nation and having been called the N-word one time too many, and having not be uh, served in restaurants, and having um when I sent off my college application for as an undergraduate we still had to include photographs along with your application. So if they couldn't tell by my name who and what I was, they could tell by the photograph who and what I was. So living through the system and seeing it over and over again, like 
I'm not bumping my head against that wall anymore, but I'm excited by these young people that said, we're not bumping our heads. We're going to keep banging with our fists and with clubs and whatever we can until the wall comes down. And so that gives me a hope. What we see in certain communities, because there was two types of protesting and rioting going on in the case of George Floyd, there was also out of that a sense of hopelessness. And we cannot uh, deny the fact that there is a segment of the population among African-Americans that are feeling hopeless Absolutely. and um, are not valuing their lives as much because they don't feel they live in a place where their lives are valued. And I know you see this as a therapist and a counselor, young black men and women. I, and some told my husband years ago, Mr. Lively, I don't expect to live past 21 or 25. Why should a young man feel that he sh he's not gonna be, he won't live past 21? He knows the system. When my son was born and I was hoping I'd have another daughter, my second child was a son, they placed him in my arms and I began to cry. And they thought I was overjoyed. As I looked into his eyes and saw he was, I guess, just gave birth to an African-American male. I felt my son was born with a target on his forehead. And it did not matter how kind he was or how good he was or how smart he was or how much he loved God and tried to live by those things. By the very nature of his color and his gender, he was an endangered species in this country and in this city. And I don't mean to be negative in that way, but these are some things that we are going to have to admit to Absolutely. in order to get to a place of now, what do we do? Um, I have asked my white colleagues and uh, my students as well, why is it? And you brought this up. We see a policeman that does use excessive force on a person of color. And we just want to say that is one bad apple in the bunch. He is not indicative of the rest of us. And you will find um, uh, my white colleagues and friends will say the same thing. They're, they're just the crazies because we see some of the things that have been done during the election. And my question always is, why is it that you want me to judge you not by that individual, but as a person of color, as an African-American, you want to judge us by the lowest common denominator in our group but we are not to do that um, for your group. And we still talking about what Eve Ewing was talking about in 1919, because that's what was going on that she gave one um, piece from that report when it was describing African-Americans as being thieves, as being lazy and not wanting anything. And we have to protect our communities against them. And just like that's what we saw in 1919 of people thinking they're protecting their communities and their way of life from the other, that's the same thinking we have in 2020. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's fascinating because of how these narratives were shaped when you had a people coming out of slavery who were the hardest working people. Yes. yes. Who basically <laughs> built so much of the infrastructure of yes. this country. Yeah. Who so many established big businesses, I think about Chase Bank and other businesses yeah. today, were built upon the backs of slaves. And yet they were successful in creating the narrative, oh, they're just lazy. And, 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 and as Ryan said, blaming the victim, yeah. oh, they're just lazy. Oh, they're just not trying hard enough. You know, when in reality, they are trying and they are working hard. But the system has been set up in such a way that they don't, they aren't successful. Or if they are successful, as we talked about earlier, then they're penalized for that. They're penalized, exactly. They absolutely <laughs> are, right? And I think <laughs> about, or you have a system where you have a few in certain positions and they look and say, so I think about Oprah, well, why can't all of you be like Oprah? Why can all of you be this acceptable, you know, because we do have what are considered 
your acceptable yes. Negroes. Yeah. Your acceptable yeah. persons, right? The Michael Jordans and the Oprahs and people like that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and not realizing that those who are successful have to be so many odds to get there. When I was a child, I was told, and this was things in most black families and people of color, and you probably heard this yourself in Barbados. As a person of color, you had to be work twice as hard and be twice as smart just to be average. And that was that was the um, that was the bottom line. And I, I laughed at that because even the reputation in slavery that uh, black people steal. Well, most of them were starving, so that chicken they might have stole from the uh, uh, master or that extra biscuit out of the kitchen to take home to their children is because they were just given enough food yeah. to keep them yeah. going. Um, you have black men that have been incarcerated, so many of them at one time or men of color, you can't get a job because now you have a police record, and many times based on um, minor infractions. One was being caught with small. Um, quantities of marijuana. They were not big time drug dealers, but now it's legalized and we're selling it. But there are men that have lost their rights to vote, could not get jobs, have uh, criminal records, all because of that. And and you, I know you're aware of the, the um, was it the corporatization of the penal system? Now they're, they're no different than Joe Turner and back in the day when they were uh, convicting black men because they needed them in the penal system to build roads, to build buildings, to dig ditches, et cetera. Free labor still. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I think about Obama. Obama tried to eliminate the private the private uh, justice system and it came yes. out with, with the president right after him. <laughs> you know, it came out with, with the president right after him. And I just think about all of those pieces and, and how throughout history oppression continues in different forms and factions yes. and people yes. you know I, te I tell um, my students and I tell people like African-American people are some of the most resilient um, and still some of the sweetest and most generous people you meet um, and they had to be and they had to keep that faith and that hope alive because in the midst of oppression in the midst of systems that really uh, don't want to see you succeed in order to live, in order to enjoy life, in order to um, continue from day to day. You absolutely needed to have that posture. You absolutely needed that hope. You absolutely needed to be resilient and to keep going yeah. and to push through. So as we wrap up, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lively, what would you want to leave with our audience today, thinking about the students who could be watching this and so on? What would you want to leave with them? Today? I want them to be very aware of where we have been as a nation so that they can see this thing has been going on too long. And I want them uh, one of my students in my um, multicultural post-colonial lit class, after we'd finished um, a particular section, uh, we were talking about, uh, I think it was after Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. And uh, one of the young women, she just placed her head within her hands and was shaking her head. She said, Dr. Lobby, what can we do? What can we do? This is when one young Caucasian woman. And my, I said to her, you make a difference just where you are. And it may not be for you to be out in the streets with your protest signs and, and marching. That may not be who you are, but there are friends and there are families and there are spaces that you are part of and that you commit yourself to being one that will make sure justice is being served in the speech and the behavior and the ways that you can. Um, uh, Booker T. Washington had said that in his uh, speech at the American, um, uh, at, at the exposition, uh, World's Fair. He said, drop your bucket where you are. I would encourage the students to do just that. Um, I often tell my students, I don't think there's gonna be any really change until my generation dies off, till all of us die off when we have a new generation. But I'm believing that our hope does lie within your students and my students, they have the option because they've been given enough information 
they have an option to choose whether or not they're going to believe the false narrative that has been created surrounding who we are as a nation and who people of color are, or they can embrace truth. And I, and I, I strongly, um, I urge them to, in, to embrace the truth and what you see, narratives of truth, to seek out narratives of truth. Is this really what they say it is, or is there something else? Um, yeah, that's what I'd encourage them to do. And, and if you've read 1919, I'm glad you read it for your class, whatever, read it again. Over break when you're not rushing through it and hear the voices, see the images and see how much of what's in this book do you still see going on in our culture now? And then ask yourself, what can you do to make a change, to contribute to change? That's what I want to tell you. Ask yourself, what can you do to change them? Because it's going to have to start with us. The system, we change the system through our votes. So make sure you're voting. Yeah, but that's what I want them to know. Um, they do make a difference. They have the power to make a difference if they choose it. If they choose it. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting me. Let, this has been the highlight of my day, my week. You've given me energy to finish out the last three weeks of the semester. So I really appreciate being able to uh, be here with you and just to talk to you today. Thank you so much. It was, as I knew, it would be a very informative and very uh, invigorating and inspiring <laughs> conversation. I knew from the beginning that I wanted to sit down with you and have this conversation. So I am so thankful that you get, you, you created that time to read through the book and to, to think about it and to bring your wealth of knowledge to us. Um, we, are, we are so very thankful for you, Dr. Lively. Um, and, and what, uh, before I go, I want to say that uh, Rain Valley, uh, your students, your Mr. you have a gem in uh, Shania Ray. She is committed to to truth and to to uh, to unity and to peace. Uh, and I, I appreciate that. Even though you ruffle some feathers, I appreciate your commitment to truth and unity and equity. Uh, yeah, so I, I would do this for you. <laughs> I do this for you because I knew it was going to be good. It's gonna be good, thank you. Wonderful, well, thank you and thank you everyone. Um, if anybody wants to reach you, is there a email they can mm -hmm. email you at? Um, my email address is j-l-i-v-e-l-y at elmhurst, E-L-M-H-U-R-S-T dot E-U-D. J Lively at Elmhurst dot uh, dot EUD. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, uh, thank you. Yes. Well, thank you again. All thank right. you all. Thank you.